we'll do this thing. All right. Welcome to the Living the Fit Life podcast, episode 51. I'm your host, Chad Mueller, and I'm joined by Coach ADJ. How's it going, dude? Quarterfinals this weekend? Good, good, good. Yeah, teeing it up. First workout tonight, and then we're going to be rolling all weekend. So pumped, but uh, workouts got leaked a little bit this morning, so it was nice to get a little sneak peek into them and excited. Yeah, yeah, lots of competition. We'll definitely have some more podcasts with the quarterfinals, uh, but today... We're joined. I'm very excited to have Greg Hetherington, former CFL player, owner of Fuel Training Club in Toronto, and a very fit person on the call today. How's it going, Greg? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I followed you for a while now. Um, really great to have you on the call. Um, I'm really interested in diving into the sort of your background. Like most of the people we talk to, especially some of our guests, they have some sort of high level athletic background. And then, you know, once they get older and grow up kind of thing, you know, fitness is still part of their life, but it's transition. And a lot of the people, our listeners tend to relate a lot with that. So I think that you're a great candidate for that. And I think, um, yeah, it's really awesome to have you on the show. Yeah. Happy to be here. Nice, nice, nice. Um, yeah, Adam, go ahead. Awesome. So Greg, yeah, man, it's, it's been, uh, as a fellow gym owner, it's been a crazy couple of years. Um, I've been to Greg's gyms a couple of times in Toronto and uh, his community, much like ours, is this community of high performers and they get their workouts in before and after work. But COVID uh, kind of threw a little bit of wrench into that. Uh, over the past two years but Greg like LP just pivoted right away and he's as we're talking to him now he's sitting in his garage gym and he's been running <laughs> online workouts and he's created this amazing online community um, as well as his gym so uh, pretty cool but the reason this conversation kind of sparked is because Greg's a weekend warrior like us and he was playing football with his buddies I think and he tore his Achilles what was sure that did. a couple weeks ago three we're three and a half weeks in uh but yeah yeah it's it's exactly how it sounds <laughs> so yeah you know like all of us super fit guy goes out to have some fun with buddies and kind of throws a damper into his training plan yeah I, I mean life mainly but yeah training training too you know not being yeah, able to to drive yeah. and walk like, upstairs no no but absolutely right like i think you know training's part of it but all the other little things that you don't really consider that often other injuries don't impact that much yeah yeah but yeah, greg's it's... done an incredible job pivoting and that's kind of what sparked this conversation is because oftentimes we see people get sidelined with injuries and then their training plan gets totally derailed in a negative way and you've kind of took this positive spin on it. Um, and we're excited to just dive into that a little bit more today. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw that on the, on the, on your Instagram and I was like, Oh shit. Cause I was thinking about like, man, we got to have you on the podcast at one point. And I saw that. I was like, Oh, that sucks. Maybe another reason why we should get you on there. Cause you, you definitely didn't slow down, um, with your training. So I'm looking forward to getting into that. But before we sort of dive into that, I wanted to, get maybe a brief sort of idea of sort of your background, sort of athletic fitness, you were a CFL player. How have you gotten to sort of this point where you are now? Like, what is your sort of story? You know, fitness started well before football did. Football was not, you know, I didn't play it growing up. I just, you know, in high school, going to college playing football is a better step for a lot of sport. Well, for, for that sport in particular, you know, baseball and hockey, um, basketball, it, I, I wasn't excelling necessarily in those to the same extent and football provided the best opportunity. And I just started playing in grade 11, 12, uh, and then jumped in in college and went to McGill, uh, oh, took a man. kinesiology degree. So that was sort of where the, the education behind fitness, although that really started sooner, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, just, I, you know, I, I fell in love, not 
honestly, to be completely transparent, not so much with football itself. It was the culture. It was the, you know, camaraderie. I grew up playing baseball, hockey, basketball, and, you know, there's a hundred guys in a locker room on a football team. Um, it's a big, it's a big team. You get to know a lot of people. Um, the training was just, for me, the group training was what really motivated me. I, I, I really learned that in my first off season was how much fun it was to train with a bunch of friends, all striving towards the same goal, having a healthy level of competition and really it being, you know, what I was looking forward to most every day. And uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm, I'm a competitive person, so I love playing football, but it was really that culture of training. And I just, you know, kept that up afterwards. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people on the other side of the spectrum who are just phenomenal athletes, didn't really love training. And then once sport is over, they don't continue with that training. And I feel like that's where, you know, I was just getting started. Cool. Cool. So what age did you play uh, football through? So I finished in 2009. Um, I played, so I was drafted by the Calgary Stampeders in 2007. I uh, went to BC in 2008, played there 2008, 2009. Uh, mainly practice roster first two years, but it was really the third year when I cracked the roster. That was sort of my biggest accomplishment, personal accomplishment. And uh, in the off season, I started managing a gym in Toronto. And for most people who know the CFL is not, you know, you're, you're at the end of your uh, professional career. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was looking at what the next step was. And, and I wasn't, you know, going to be a perennial all-star and, and make a, a long-term career at a football saw the opportunity with fitness, um, left, uh, in 2010 and have just been going since then at the, uh, at the business model side of the fitness industry. Amazing. And so, so, uh, for the listeners, fuel training would, I know Adam, you've been there. Would you say it's, it's similar to sort of LP and it's sort of the same sort of group training model? Yeah, very similar. We had one of our longtime members, Andrew Fung for, our, uh, our original LP crew, he moved to Toronto for work. He said, where should I train? What should I do? And right away we said fuel. And I think he, he gelled in that community, just like he did here. Very similar model in terms of. And, and Tess McAndrew. And Tess. Yes, yeah. Right, right, the OG. Right. Tess is the OG. She'll be mad at me if I, yeah. She'll be, yeah. <laughs> you know, we can just edit that. You know, put her a segment first and then, then talk about Funger. <laughs> exactly. Both of them. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, yeah, Greg, before COVID, you had three facilities up and running, um, kind of in, in different parts of the city. And then I don't know what COVID did to all that, but uh, the community, yeah, exactly like ours, trying to live the, the fit life, as we call it. For you guys, your slogan is be better. And um they're pushing it every day and trying to balance family and career and life and stay fit and healthy. And yeah, exactly the same as LP. Yeah, definitely geared to fitness enthusiasts. Um, we're, we're not, we're not a CrossFit. So that's probably the biggest differentiation, but I find, you know, from a culture standpoint, community, like we did a, a fundraiser together last, two days ago. Now that's two years ago now. Um, and it was, you know, I, I was actually just looking at it uh, a couple of weeks ago and it was for the uh, Children's Aid Foundation. And, and we raised over $5,000 uh, between what was there? Five of us across Canada, five gyms across Canada. And yes, uh, that. yeah, yeah it, and I mean, all completely like when you when you talk about it from a fitness standpoint, like maybe the types of workouts that you would deliver, but from a community standpoint, I mean, almost identical. I think you could have stepped into any one of those facilities. And I think that's where the industry is really thriving right now is in these small group facilities that are really prioritizing building relationships. Yeah, that's cool. And, and like what, what spurred the creation of fuel? Was it, was it a sense of community for you or was it more or less what you were saying before? Like you really enjoyed the group training model and you wanted to make it work as sort of a, a sort of a career. Yeah, the so I got into definitely so for context, I started with personal training and managing a personal training studio. I was in Calgary actually at the time, so it was 2007, uh, learning from someone out there, a place called Innovative Fitness. Uh, Vince Danielson was a, a great mentor, 
and understood that that model. It was a smaller group and Innovative is, they're, they're based out of Vancouver and they've expanded since then. There's, there's one in Toronto, but they were all about destination fitness. So for executives and professionals who aren't necessarily training, not even weekend warriors, but those who wanted to train towards, let's say climbing Mount Kilimanjaro or going to Moab hmm. and doing a, a, a mountain biking circuit, um, going, we did a cat ski trip. So you'd formulate these programs around these destinations and these events. And I thought that was a really interesting way to look at it because everything I was training for was always sport, right? And you thought, well, wait a minute, people actually train for other things, but you know, I was a naive <laughs> yeah. 21, 22 year old. And, but then I realized as a trainer, the aspect missing from that one-on-one -on -one session was that, that group element. Like you definitely, like you, you had, a, there's definitely a community with the trainers um, and, and the clients in there but it just wasn't the same as training together. Like I did playing football. So as you alluded to, and I, I found that, I think I first discovered CrossFit in 2007, 2008. I remember someone introducing it to me. I'm like, this is very similar, you know, to, to football in a sense, everyone's training towards it. And, uh, but I realized it was, that was its own sport. I mean, it, it's evolved ever since then. Uh, and I, you know, was still playing football. So a lot of the training was geared towards athletics and high in, high intensity intervals and, you know, like hockey shift type training. So it took that path. And I realized that the community uh, group training was the most motivating experience for a fitness enthusiast to put themselves in an environment to succeed. Very cool. That's cool. And like, what was the what was the transition like for you as a pro athlete, sort of going to a weekend warrior or a lifestyle athlete? Like, was that difficult for you? Yeah, at first, because I stopped, the one good thing is I stopped on my own terms. So I still felt like I could play and it took me, you know, a couple months into the season to realize, ah, oh, maybe I made a mistake. Um, but, you know, looking back at it, it was definitely a good time. You know, I, who knows, I could have been cut in camp, right? And then right. not had a job and who knows what I would have been doing probably at that time had gone to Fort McMurray, but the, uh, you know, with, with regards to being a lifestyle athlete, there's, there's a uh, fairly competitive touch football league. I know for those that don't aren't familiar with it, it sounds a bit like an oxymoron, you know, but, but the touch football leagues throughout Canada, throughout, you know, North America really are the next step down from football. So that's, that's where the dinosaurs, you know, the, the <laughs> dinosaurs of football go to play. So it's like a beer so, league football kind of thing. Not, step not, up. No it's not, so step I would up. say okay. beer league, it is, don't get me wrong. You know, guys, guys are definitely drinking after games, but it's, it's not like your beer league hockey week to week. It's like weekend okay. tournaments. You know, you'd go to okay. Kingston for the weekend, Belleville, and they're all former for the most part, at least collegiate level football players, many professional level football players. And, you know, people just love running routes and catching balls. So, uh, that was a very good transition for me because it allowed me to continue to well, one enjoy playing football and sort of edge that transition of competitiveness um, and still have something to train for. So that was good. And uh, yeah. And then got out of that really when, when fuel started, it was just, there was just no more time. Yeah. What I, I have to ask, what position did you play football receiver? Yeah. Okay. That's what I was going to assume <laughs> you're pretty lean pretty fit guy um very cool and so like how has your your personal fitness journey sort of evolved to like now uh, i guess before your your sort of injury so like you go from obviously doing a lot of strength stuff explosive movements with football training you then sort of move out and start fuel training which is sort of a general sort of fitness structure for you how has your sort of fitness sort of evolved to like now, like, I guess before COVID, what was it like? Yeah. You know, I mean, funny enough, I sort of neglected a lot of that training when the gym opened. Uh, I was, when I was playing football, I was like 220, 225. And then I would, I was dropped down to like 200 pounds shortly after, you know, from yeah, doing man, the same training. Language. Yeah. That's yeah, came, you're talking came. my weight. <laughs> You know, I'm six four, so you know, and, and six I'm five. Here we I, go. We're like, there you go. Okay, there we go. Yeah, uh, and I I wasn't training as much, and really before COVID, the focus was on creating the classes for for others. So 
that transition, as you said, like a lot of the power training, I wasn't doing the Olympic lifts like I was before. Um, that was a big part of our football training, at least. I know there's a lot of different methodologies from different colleges now, but um, that was a big part of the training that I did and uh, transitioned a little bit more to, to general fitness. Mm -hmm. And then really when COVID hit is when things really changed. That I, I started putting on weight, good weight, because I was leading these kettlebell classes. So we went, we went the route of kettlebells and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'd always, we'd always use kettlebells and they'd been a part of our programming, but now it was every, it was every day. And it, it's amazing. You know, you preach that, Hey, you just need to keep working out and things, good things happen. But when you've got a kettlebell in a front rack position, five days a week, you just get stronger. You don't need to do much else. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's simple. <laughs> yeah. It's that simple. So yeah, fitness wise, I mean, obviously before the Achilles injury, it was, you know, we've been in and out as you, you, as everyone can understand of gyms opening, gyms closing. Um, and, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to set up this home gym and, and get a barbell in here and a pull up bar and some rings and be able to still do some of those movements. But I really benefited from adding the variety of kettlebells. Like I've felt better in the past two years training than I have in the past 10. That's for sure. And maybe I think I'm stronger now than I was, you know, in my mid twenties, definitely not faster, <laughs> but the, the variety, um, the change of pace, like having going, it's a great contrast going from strength training with barbells to, to kettlebells. Uh, I threw a ski erg in the garage. I do a lot of track work. So I'm still doing a lot of work on the track and a rower. And I just found having a, a a wide range of you know, modalities, especially kettlebells helped me quite a bit. Well, I went, I, when I was, uh, this was years ago before COVID, I was traveling for work and I found a kettlebell gym in San Francisco called SF swing. And it's mm -hmm. legit, just a gym with kettlebells in it, only kettlebells. And they have, they did like all these crazy, like figure eights. And it was a pretty decent workout. And I just, it was crazy. Cause it's kind of set up like across the gym, but like there's literally hundreds kettlebells. of kettlebells <laughs> hundreds of them of all yeah. sizes it's crazy but i can I, I get it like are you are you somebody that in your sort of fitness journey are you a person that sort of dabbles in all you mentioned crossfit like have you da you dabble into all these types of different modalities of of fitness to learn and educate and then you kind of just build your own sort of protocol over time definitely learning through experience um you know, there's also the business side of it, right? Like finding movements and formats and programs that fit a certain demographic. Uh, and I think that for me is, is sort of the fun part, discovering what works there, but then also for myself, yeah, finding what works well for me. And that's probably to answer your question in fewer words is been finding that balance between everything um, from a training standpoint. Yeah. I, I mean, I see it with Adam too. Like obviously Adam's dabbled into CrossFit and endurance sports heavily, but even before that, I mean, our LP was Olympic lifting and it was very much body weight. So, I mean, there is a journey of fitness, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I look back at, you know, if I see videos of myself swinging a kettlebell 10 years ago, I'd be, you know, embarrassed to, to put them online right now. Uh, and, and just, you know, how things have evolved, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, quantitative measures were far more important than qualitative measures. Now it's, you know, I'm not as concerned. My working max is not the, the priority. You know, my old, my PRs are in the past for some things and uh, working maxes and, and, and working at one or two reps short uh, to, to work on range of motion. Like these are all things that I think anyone who's been in the industry long enough sees that evolution happen. That's cool. Is, and isn't it interesting that like, Without COVID, you might not have uncovered that. Like, you know what I mean? Like COVID, like I always tell Adam, like the first year of COVID with LP, like, I mean, he didn't force us, but you know, he coached us into doing body weight stuff and I hate body weight. I'm six, five, <laughs> like 200 some pounds. I'm not mobile. And, but like after like a few months of the first year in COVID, like I felt way more mobile than I ever did before. And I was like, okay. That was the big thing with kettlebells, the mobility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, getting forced to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. I mean, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. So you can <laughs> take advantage of those opportunities of things you wouldn't otherwise be doing. For sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I, 
I want to dive into the injury because I think I I've been really impressed with some of the stuff you've been posting and we'll definitely share your, your Instagram handle out on the podcast, but um, maybe if you can, for those who don't know, like how significant of an injury have you sustained? Like what's, what's the, yeah. Like right now, like you're, let's talk about this injury. Cause I think this is what people will listen to. Cause I think there's a lot of people that can relate. Like, how do you overcome these injuries, these setbacks? I think maybe, um, yeah. If you can tell us like the significance of this injury now that you're dealing with. Yeah. I mean, injuries are a part of life, obviously to different extents, you know, people go through varying degrees of either back pain to spraining an ankle to rupturing an Achilles. Right. And I think especially playing sports, you know, you just, you just have this mindset that the injury is a temporary setback, but I've never had an injury this severe. I've had injuries more painful, like cracking ribs, way more painful, not nearly as severe, right? Like it, it, it's, that's probably one of the worst things. Um, Spraining an ankle feels worse. Snapping an Achilles. I had to take a step to realize what had happened, you know, and then hop off and and then, and it really took a little bit to clue in like what was going on because most injuries, the pain is so indicative of how, things are going to function after. And this one has just been very strange. It's been very debilitating. It's a long recovery process. And for those who don't know, the Achilles is the tendon that attaches your heel essentially to your calf. And once that thing goes and it, and it, it literally, it, it, it snapped sort of in the middle there and you have nothing connecting you at the bottom of your foot. And because there's so little blood flow in that extra, I can see, I know every time I've said, so the first few times I said <laughs> this, gross. I kind of was queasy, you know, thinking about it. Now I've watched, you know, surgeries online, uh, ruptures of them actually happening in slow motion. Uh, oh. I've, I've been diving deep into the literature behind the recovery behind it. Uh, spoken to different orthos, different uh, athletic therapists, chiros, just on different roads to recovery to get a better understanding. But it, it's just, it takes so long to recover and it really is life altering, you know, temporarily, but it's life altering. And, uh, at first, you know, I was thinking, all right, so (laughs) I can't drive, but then you start to realize, okay, I can't pick up kids from school, drop off kids from school. Uh, I can't go, I don't get groceries. I can't get myself to work, to do something, you know, last minute, uh, and, you know, going up and down stairs is annoying. Uh, there's just all these things you don't, you don't realize like flying, for instance, uh, you get, you have to consider blood clots. You know, I'm, I'm getting on a Mm -hmm. flight this weekend. Actually, I got to take a baby aspirin starting tomorrow for a week. Uh, and there's all of these inconveniences that you don't really think about. And the whole time this is happening, the biggest concern is re-rupturing it. And so I've gone the non-operative route. And for those that are familiar with it, like 10, 15 years ago, you'd probably get a ruptured Achilles operated on. But there's been a lot of progress in um, rehabilitation programs that that get you out of a cast sooner and put you into a walking cast to get Mm -hmm. some more uh, load bearing, which is going to help aid in the recovery. And that's shown significant improvements in non-operative Achilles rehabilitation. And yeah, I'm three and a half weeks in, um, starting to do a little bit of load bearing now. There's a few different schools of thought on it, but I feel like I've made a fairly educated decision and, uh, there's still lots you can do. I guess the moral of the story there is there's still lots you can do. You might not be able to do what you were able to do before, but there's still lots you can do. Yeah. It's been so cool watching you transition. I, like, I just, I'm fascinated by your mindset around just like almost attacking this injury and wanting to learn so much about it. It's that from, you know, years of playing football and other sports and like other injuries, or do you feel like you have a new mindset around? It's so different. Yeah. I have a new mindset because I've never had to like, okay. It helps to have a kinesiology degree and have a understanding of, of movement. Like these are all assets for sure. And having been, you know, fairly good shape before the injury, that's also an asset going into it. Um, you know, but 
I've never, like, it's so hard to describe because it's not, when I say it's not painful, it's uncomfortable. And there's like weird cramps that go on in your calf that you can't really control. Cause normally with a cramp, let's say your hamstring cramps, or your quad cramps, you just extend or flex your leg. Can't do anything with the ankle. So I just let that calf fire watching the little, you know, the fibers <laughs> go dance around in there. And it's as uncomfortable as it, and weird as it sounds. Um, and then I'll just like in the middle of the night, I'll be, uh, you know, I'll be in a dead sleep and I'll just wake up with like a, a major cramp in my calf or my toes are like, feel like fire because the circulation is cut off, you know, like the nerves, like there's just like these weird things I've never experienced. So any prior injury experience, and I've got a lot that I've had is almost, you know, irrelevant for this. Um, and I've never had to adjust my lifestyle as much for an injury as I have had for this. And I think that's, I think I realized right when it happened, how much effort this was going to take to, to understand what was going on and how to best approach this. Because my, my biggest thing, and this is probably a bit more of a rant, but a lot of it, because it's so new, right? When you think about it, they're still performing surgeries on professional athletes. Uh, I look at, there's a starting running back for the LA Rams, Cam Akers. This is the fastest recovery. He ruptured his Achilles end of July before preseason. He played in the AFC championship and then NFC championship. And then, oh, wait a minute, no AFC. And then he went into the Super Bowl. That's five and a half months that it took for him. And normally for someone to get back at that level, it's, it's a year to two years. Now you can get back to walking around within you know three months, but for someone to recover that quickly, you know, I, I really wanted to find out how he did it, you know? And the answer to that is I probably won't be able to do that because I don't have access to that rehabilitation and, and whatnot. Most like most normal civilians would, but there's a lot to learn from it. The type of, of rehabilitation he was doing and, you know, there's not a lot of general information out there for people who have Achilles ruptures. It's actually, it's amazing. You search Google for, you know, Achilles rupture pain, Achilles, what should I expect? It's all, it's all people who have ruptured it, filming themselves on YouTube. Like there are some physio mm -hmm. posts on like what, what I have, which is like a sheet of exercises to do, but there's no real accounts of like, how did you deal with this from a training standpoint? Like, all of the milestones are time-based. So it's like, you can't do this until four weeks, but there's no consideration for someone who's more active and more able to, to do this. So who's to say that there's another milestone that might be faster for that individual. So I, I'm not rushing anything. I've got no competition to get ready for, you know, I'm not going to be playing the Super Bowl anytime soon, but for me, you know, I want, I, I want to, I don't want to re-rupture it obviously. And I don't want to have an elongated tendon, which leads to less power. And I want to be able to perform at the same level, if not more than I did when this injury happened. So I've set a goal. I mean, I could, I could dunk before this. So my goal is by next year, I'm 40 next year is to be able to dunk at 40. And that will be my, that's what I'm, I'm setting my training towards. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. You're a man on a mission. If you had like some steps that you, you took, was it like what I'm, what I'm hearing is like, get educated on it. Was, was that number one or like, what was it? Yeah. yeah 100%. Find Yeah. Get educated on it. Read. There's lots you can, you can find all the studies, you know, so that you don't, you're not reading, you know, some men's health article, someone else's opinion. So you can formulate your own right. and then right. speak to, you know, no, no offense to anyone who's written in there, but, but I mean like looking at the actual, data that shows how they were doing these these recovery processes speak to a couple different orthos don't just speak to one because and again no offense to anyone who's an ortho they obviously know a lot more than i do but when you see an ortho at the hospital they're not always a foot and ankle specialist they might you know be working on a shoulder a hip and although the achilles is not rocket science it's different than having someone who is repairing an achilles tendon every day right that they're in an operating room so finding a foot specialist um, speaking with rehabilitation, uh, experts who have dealt with athletes and recovery, not normal population, because it's, there's a risk reward to this, like most elements in fitness. And it's, I would say it's better to be on the less risky side and take an extra month to recover than it is to rush it. Right. Because this is like, this, you know, to, to go, as I said, another year from now to full performance, three to four months for like normal lifestyle, but 
in the grand scheme of things, a month while risking a re-rupture and having to restart this, you just, you need to be careful. But I do think if you know what you are doing and you, you get an informed decision on what you should be doing, that you can take control of your rehab and do things that you might've thought weren't possible to do. So, and then you set these goals, like, but I feel like that was the next step is you're like, you're laying out this timeline. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at, yeah. And I think it's a realistic timeline. I mean, on, on goals, I mean, Adam, you really motivated me because I've, and, and you probably saw this, but this, you know, 500 pound deadlift yeah. sub five minute mile has sort of been floating around the world wide web for a little bit, but you know, seeing, seeing you do it, I was just like, I've wanted to do this, but now I'm going to do this. Yeah. And not because I think, you know, I, I followed you for a while in your, all of your fitness journeys. And I'm like, this is the level that you're at is what I aspire to be. And if I can get back, cause that was my goal for this May. That was my goal. Yeah, this yeah, May. I was getting down there. I was pumped. <laughs> there. Yeah. On the sideline a bit for that, but that'll come back. I think, I think that's actually, that's a that's a that's still a realistic goal maybe when i'm 41 but let's see right, the, the dunk right. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like that's that must be so like in like so it, it happens the doc says you've you've ruptured the achilles tendon in your mind you're probably thinking you probably already know how long it's going to be then he tells you it's going to be a year he might give you even longer than that like what is your mindset like how do you like because right then and there no offense to the general population, but most people would be like, shit, I am screwed. I'm going to sit my ass on the couch for the next year. You know, depress like a lot, honestly, a lot of things, obviously depression, a lot of things will come into play here. Like, how do you, is like, is it just your fitness ability? Like that, is it your community? Like, how do you get your, your mind and not let yourself go to those sort of darker places? Well, they definitely go to those darker places. It's a matter of getting out of those darker places. And I think this is one thing the pandemic helped with is, 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 you know, dealing with setbacks. And I think what I realized if I were to learn, especially the psychological element of training, I never really thought of working out as a form of a, you know, just, just setting myself loose from every other problem that's going on and being able to exercise and have that that psychological benefit. I never really looked at, I mean, I always knew that it was there, but for me, I was always driven to train. Uh, maybe I hadn't had something as serious as this happened yet. And then as soon as the pandemic happened, I realized how important training was for your, your mental health. And I knew that if I wasn't training during some of those times that it was tougher for me to get through a day. And this is very much the same. I like obviously injury pandemic, you know, two different scenarios, but the way I look at it is if I'm not training, it's going to be worse than, than if I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I guess like, and like the timing thing. So like, I met, like, obviously you said ups and downs, right? Like, and on a daily basis, like what are some of the things that you're, you're trying to implement into your sort of mindset or routine to make sure that you are hitting that goal and that, you know, this isn't, this is, it, this is an inconvenient and it sucks, but it's not, uh, not impossible to get through the next day and keep going. You know, I, I don't know. I, I think I mean, it's, it's a tough just, question. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I don't know. I like, I like challenge. <laughs> Maybe that's the so best way to look at it. So, I think, I mean, I guess it's goal, goal oriented, like what Adam's saying too, like very much like if, a, if you have a goal in place, most likely Greg, you're, you're going to hit it, right? Like, you know, you set a goal and you're going to get there. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to make, I'm going to make an effort. I'm not going to set a goal and then just think, okay, it might happen. It's, it's got to be, you know, planned out. Here's what needs to happen. And uh, I've, you know, I've kind of enjoyed exploring what I can do on, on one leg. Uh, and there's, there's, as I said, there's a lot, like, I mean, I'm not, I can't go out for a run, uh, which is the thing I probably miss the most. And when I say run, I mean, you know, 400 meter sprints around yeah, the track, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but I, I become a skier fiend. Like I feel like ski erging on one leg. Cause I've got this, you know, this, this, uh, walking crutch, which has been the, the mm -hmm. savior. So it's like a hands-free crutch. It's fantastic. Anyone who has it or anyone who is 
on crutches should get one of those because it allows you to do things like, you know, make a cup of coffee without burning yourself. But um, mm -hmm. being able to ski with one leg has actually helped me improve my form. And I've realized, you know, mm -hmm what I was doing incorrectly before, because I'm forced to hinge more because I don't have a knee to squat with necessarily. So I, you know, I've, I, and I would summer, I was just thinking about this morning I was doing, so I, I would never have done a 40 or 60 minute skier before like that would, to me would have been a waste of time, but you know, the last few weeks, that's what I've been doing because it's really the only thing I can do to get my heart rate up. I figured out a mm. way to Jerry rig a, uh, a rower now, and I'll be able to get on a bike in a few weeks. But the ski erg has been, you know, if I want to push it safely, right? Because again, mm -hmm. I don't want to elongate the tendon. I don't want to re-rupture it. If I want to push myself and get my heart rate into that highest zone, the ski erg is how I do it. Awesome. Yeah, we, you know, we talked a lot about what you're doing fitness wise and you have this roadmap and timeline built out. But I feel like I see you talking a lot about your nutrition and even some of the other self-care stuff you, you've been starting to do uh what do you think about nutrition like where where is that going to play a factor in the recovery process yeah i was really uh dialed into a routine nutrition wise like that's been something like i'm someone who you could give me the same thing every day you know, as long as it's nutritious and, and I'm not going to complain, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't get me wrong. I like variety. It's not like I'm, I'm, I don't have a palate, but uh, for me, I, I don't need, I, I prefer the routine than, than changing up a lot. So this one has been a lot of me diving deep into my own personal uh, biometrics, you know, analytics of caloric intake, caloric expenditure, um, looking at the number of steps that I've taken, the number of floors that I'm taking. And it's clear that I'm not doing as much as I was before. So I've definitely adjusted the amount that I'm eating just to decrease that a little mm -hmm. bit. I'm trying to keep my caloric that that's a, that's actually a daily goal is to hit a minimum of expenditure just so that I can continue on a similar path there. Um, but from a qualitative standpoint, I've made more of an effort to ensure that I'm eating more vegetables, uh, getting more protein in, uh, and, and ensuring that, you know, I'm staying hydrated, all of which would hinder your ability to recover. It's mm. less so about, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to, to build too much right now, but, uh, but, but make sure that I'm not decreasing the speed of recovery. Makes sense. I would, I wouldn't even thought of that. Like, like if your your calorie input, um, just like, not obviously being able to walk around as much or, and obviously you'll gain some weight just by default. I mean, yeah. Yeah. That could be, it could be easy could get away from you. Right. Um, but, but it's something, you know, I'm someone who's burning before Achilles, you know, 3,600 calories a day four to 4,000 cal calories a day. So for me, my, my balance is I need to be eating around 3,600 to yeah. 4,000 calories a day. If I want to maintain weight, um, now it's lot. dropped down to about 32, 3,400, which might not seem like a lot when you compound that over the duration of the injury that could lead to some, some undesirable weight gain from a performance standpoint. Like if I want to, you know, get right back onto the track and look at running certain times and being able to do things mm -hmm. that I was doing before, I don't want to then have to spend another month having to lose the weight that is preventing me from hitting some of these goals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. And and what what is sort of I know you you do a lot of recovery. I know that you're you're sort of a, a cold plunge sort of guy, and I imagine you've done a lot of different recovery stuff. So what does like the recovery protocols look like now with the injury? Like I guess focus on the injury and also just focus on your on your body. Mm -hmm. The so sleep first one that's always been for me priority. Strangely, of everything that's happened in the past month, sleep has gotten better. <laughs> Okay. And I attribute that to a few things, but that's a huge part of recovery too, is making sure you're sleeping enough. Are you on the um, whoop? Are you on the whoop? I'm on, I'm on, I'm on aura. Aura. Ooh, oh, our first yeah, competitor. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all good. And, all good. They're all the same. Yeah, they're all good. They're all, I know. I mean, I just, I've got a, a Garmin watch, right? So having gotcha. a whoop and a watch, it gets, there's a little more uh, uh, redundancy there, but um, okay. yeah, for me, sleep, making sure I'm sleeping, making so sure. So your, your sleep has improved. Your sleep has improved post injury. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, okay. I mean, that could be a whole other podcast because I'm waiting for the full month of data to make a more educated uh, analysis on why that is. But my early speculation 
is I'm being forced to sleep on my back. Like I have to lift my legs up, keep my leg up elevated to um, prevent swelling and those like rampage oh, cramps that I call them that happen in the middle of the night. Like if my leg slips down in the middle of the night, you can guarantee something's happening. So yeah. I've got my legs propped up and I'm forced on my back and I'm just, I'm sleeping like a baby right now. It's so, it's weird. Wow. I really thought this was going to affect me more. Um, and uh, sleep has gotten better. I don't know if that's the same for everyone, but for me at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then secondary to that is making sure I move first thing in the morning. Like, as I said, blood flow is a big concern when you're looking at extremity injuries, making sure that you're getting enough blood flow. So I want to make sure that I'm, I'm increasing blood flow to those areas, especially the elevated leg. And that's just through gentle, you know, my, my general prep in the warm up, and I do my workout first thing in the morning. That's why I'm doing these like steady state cardio intervals too, because I want to get, I want to increase my stroke volume, my, you know, my cardiac output, get that blood flowing so that that is helping aid in recovery, at least not hurt it. Um, I'm doing a concept called contralateral strength training. So if I do tib anterior pulls and calf raises and other exercises on my non-injured leg, there is a transferable benefit to the injured leg. So a neurological adaptation to being able to do these calf raises and tib pulls means that as soon as I'm able to get out of the cast, I'm, I'm not going to be as far behind as I was had I not been doing it. Um, I've got these things Very called cool. toe spacers. I, got them uh, I, got the toe I, I carry spacers. a fanny pack a lot now because <laughs> I, 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 having to go somewhere to get it is a real pain. It's the year of the really toe spacers. Excuse. It's the year of the yeah, toe yeah. spacers. They're everywhere. Yeah, what are you finding with the toe spacers? Is that what, what's the what's the thought behind it for the Achilles? My foot is like if you if you think about it, like think about if you're playing the piano with your hands, right? And then think about playing the piano with your toes. And then imagine having your foot in a cast and then taking your foot out of the cast and then trying to play the piano with your toes. Like you mm -hmm. just can't, mm -hmm. your toes don't work. It's almost like you're sending a message to bend and it won't bend for a number of reasons. Hmm. So I will take off the, the it's an air cast now. Um, and I'll put the toe spacers on to ensure that those deep intrinsic muscles of the foot are not going completely dormant. And then it also reminds me to, to continually move them and wiggle them sort of like you do with, you know, feet and cold ski boots. You know, you got to keep those yeah, toes yeah. moving. Otherwise those things just, those things are going to freeze on you. Um, I finally yeah. gave in to the Theragun. I was not a percussion <laughs> therapy. I, it's not that I was against it, but I just, I, I don't know, maybe I'm old school, you know, the caveman tools, I had a lacrosse ball and a, a wooden dowel and, mm -hmm, you know, I'd stretch, mm -hmm. you know, who does that anymore? But uh, <laughs> the percussion therapy has been great because the leg, especially the calf, I can't get at it. And, and I'm concerned, you don't want to put, you know, the vibrations going into a healing tendon, but the muscles surrounding it. Um, and also my big concern aside from the injured leg is you're doing so much on your non-injured leg. So you're hopping around constantly. I'm single leg deadlifting everything, you know, like all the things you train for yeah. <laughs> it's happening mm -hmm. now for life. Uh, and I'm concerned about getting, you know, some, some patellar tendonitis because of that. So I always want to make sure mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting my quads, and all of the surrounding muscles around the knee loose enough so that I'm not setting myself up to, you know, be in a chair. Uh, I've gone deep into it. Yeah. I think, I think I've covered most things there, <laughs> uh, but frequent that's, movement, frequent movement too. That's, that's cool. That brought that sort of thought of the question. Like I want to dig into like what your fitness and how you sort of are programming your fitness, but like, I guess first, like you're just saying the one leg, how do you make sure that you don't overload that muscle? Mm -hmm. Like if you're, I guess you're saying you're doing everything on the single leg. How do you program your fitness to ensure that you're not, you know, obviously getting another injury or just, you know, constantly aches and pains in the, in the other side? Well, I think a lot of bros would be happy that bench press wouldn't interfere with that. So, you know, you just put a heavy dose of pull-ups and bench press in there, right? <laughs> I probably done so more bicep curls and tricep extensions in the past four weeks than I have in the past four years. So what's, what's the programming? Like, obviously you're, you're, you're in charge of it. You don't need someone to tell you what to do. Uh, mm -hmm. so what is it, what does a week look like? Like, what are you doing to stay fit? Right. All right. So five, five days of actual training, um, two days of active recovery. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday are strength days. And I've got a, uh, sort of an upper body strength circuit that I'm working on that I do after a general warm up and some rehab for the leg. So I'm alternating between horizontal, vertical pressing, horizontal, vertical pulling, doing some more co core work, taking some, uh, 
some time to work on some of the movements that I wouldn't have done because I either wouldn't mm -hmm. have had time for or made an excuse not to do. So, you know, bench press, bent over rows, and I found ways, you know, with the knee on the bench or knee on the crutch um, to do these and alternate between dumbbells and barbell. Um, and then on Fridays though, like I'm, I'm doing single leg deadlifts just to work on, you know, the hinging portion of it. But I've been, I actually took that back. I was doing two, two different leg, uh, day, like adding a leg exercise, but you do so like just going upstairs, you know, it's like doing step downs or step ups the whole way. And, uh, and, and that's where I noticed I'd overdo it. I'd go to get in the shower. Right. I'm like, okay, this is where, you know, there's an actual mm. legitimate excuse. Maybe that leg day was not a good idea, but, um, then Tuesday and Thursday are exclusively, uh, conditioning on the rower and the skier. So I get a break there. Cause I am conscious of overtraining. I realized, you know, I hadn't done, although there's a lot of things I can do, there's still overlap. And if I don't consider that, I don't want to lead to another injury with this. Uh, and then my, yeah. So those cardio days are either steady state or high intensity intervals. And, uh, then like I was saying the 40, 60 minute skis, but the weekends are active recovery. So rehabilitation movements, a lot of mobility, uh, and I'll do like 10 minute ski or row just to get the heart rate up on both of those days as well, but not, not like a, a high effort row or ski. Wow. That's great. I mean, the mindset of uh, maybe the old mindset of having an injury and taking it easy. Right. And sort of, <laughs> uh, you know, like th this idea, like I'm going to get injured and I'm going to try to work out two or three times a week versus like, and, and it's like, you're actually probably putting more effort into your training now with the, with the exercise, the rehabilitation exercises, just to like, I guess, hope like to, to quicken the recovery. It's crazy how that, cause I, I, I know I can hear, I can hear somebody in the nineties or the eighties saying this to me and like, you're crazy. You're working out seven days or you're being active seven days. It's nuts. But I mean, I, it's super inspiring. I've had a few comments, you know, people saying you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to be in that cast longer. You know, you're going to re-rupture. You're going to restart. And obviously that's a concern. Um, and I'm very aware of that, but I'm also very cognizant of the, the emotional impact of not doing anything has. And I think, you know, maybe I haven't earned enough credit to, to let people realize, know that I'm, I'm, I'm making sure I'm not overdoing it. Like this isn't all for show. This is something that I, I see as, a safe way to overcome both the physical and emotional deficit that this has caused. Yeah. And imagine those people who were old school doctors telling you not to exercise too much. Who knows? I don't even at that point, it's just sort of dismissive, but like, I definitely look if, if this ortho says, don't stay on it for four, don't, don't put any weight on it for four weeks. And then another ortho says, no, after two weeks, I've seen benefits. You, you begin to say you, there's, there's, if someone's saying two weeks and someone's saying four, where does that difference come from? And, and then, you know, when I read through the studies, they're all there, there's, you can pull two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, you know, some are like four to six. Uh, and as I said before, I just think you have to make your own educated decision. And, and, and the, the ortho is definitely, I would say the person you want to listen to the most. Um, but if, if, you know, for me, if I ask an ortho, are there considerations for varying levels of, athletic ability and fitness. And, and you also have to front that with like, look, I'm not trying to get out of this early. I just want to make sure that I'm doing everything that I can without overdoing it. And when someone says, no, everyone's four weeks. Personally, I just think that's lazy because there has to be consideration for different people. And it might not be your ability and your athleticism. It might be, I don't know, something random like your blood type or you know, your height or what you're doing, like there could just be another variable, right? To have right. a simple four week timeline that is a cookie cutter approach to everyone to me just says that there hasn't been enough research done on it. And not that I want to be my own rat study, but at the same time, I think I'm, I'm capable of doing it safely. I uh, love, love hearing the, uh, the plan and, and the, the thought that you've put into your training and nutrition and recovery and I get, I think Chad and I have got to see it over the past three weeks uh, from what you've been sharing. Through online. Instagram. <laughs> yeah. And, right. so as much and, as you share. I love to hear the thought that you've put into it and the, the regimented routine. And it's so, it, you know, you're, you're, 
you have a new goal in mind and it's no different than you were when you were training for the 500 pound dead in the five minute mile. Like you've built essentially the same incredible training plan roadmap to get you there. And that's mm-hmm. your road back to hundred percent health first and then slam Duncan at 40 years old. There you go. Yeah, literally. Oh, love it. Yeah. That's crazy. It's super inspiring. I mean, I, I think like we've talked about it, like, I was, I was going to ask another sort of dive into this a little bit, but like, like motivation, like is, is motivation, a, like, I know some people like look at motivation in different ways, but like, you're obviously motivated by motivated by something. And like, like just you hearing you talking is just like, man, like this guy's like, if I, I guess people around you that know you when this injury happened, they're probably like, yeah, I'm not worried about Greg. He's going to, he'll figure this thing out and he'll be back to, uh, back to full, full send no time. Like, it sounds like this is just another small problem. Part of the life and journey you're learning, you're super open to learning things. You're learning a ton of stuff. Like you're staying motivated by default. It feels like, or maybe that's at least I'm just like hearing like motivation is just like easy for you. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's easy. And I think that's probably, and, and both of you can attest this, you know, a lot of people just attribute, if you're in the fitness industry, it should be easy to get fit because that's your job, right? It's like saying, you know, it should be easy to get rich if you're a banker, but the, the idea behind motivating myself is really driven by if I don't do something sometimes, like really the first couple, the first week or two, like there were a few days where I'm like, I don't want to do anything. I just want to sit down, put my leg up on the couch and, uh, you know, just feel sorry for myself. Mm -hmm. And you have these, you, you, you know, like everyone, you have these, uh, maybe I'll do it later. I won't. And, and I think I've just been there too many times through my whole life. And especially the last couple of years to know that, it's always worse when you don't do something that's good for you. So, and I don't just mean from a health standpoint and I'm not trying to, you know, lecture people on, on, on life generally, but the motivation for me is yes, a goal gives me a target to work towards. And that's going to mean that getting up and going into the gym, I know what I'm doing uh, and I'm, I'm ready to do it. I don't need to, to go in and think about it, waste time and then cut a few sets short because I don't have enough time. It's really the roadmap is helpful and just knowing that it's better that I'm doing it than I'm not doing it. So cool. That's incredible. I have, I have one last question just because I think we often talk with this, like our community is fits in with this. Like you're a father, husband, you're a business owner. Fitness is a huge part of your life. Now this injury is a huge part of your life. Like how do you balance this? Like all, like how do you manage it all? to make sure that like, I, obviously your family is there to support you. And, and, and there's only so much you can do now. You can't take the kids to school as easy as you did before, but like, how do you balance this all? Like, what is your plan? I have a really good plan for working out. I don't have a really good plan for life there. That's for sure. <laughs> I would say that's, that's, I haven't found that balance yet. I think uh, my wife has been extremely supportive. I mean, she's gone from being a, you know, having both of us as a parent to, to a, a single parent, essentially for a lot of things. Uh, and that, that's mean, that's meant for her making some sacrifices and some adjustments. Uh, I, I think, you know, that's probably where I feel most, if I'm most depressed about this, it's the fact that, and, and anyone can attest this with an injury, you just, you feel useless and mm-hmm. having to depend on others is very draining initially, if you're not used to it and asking people for things and, you know, it, it's, I think that's probably that balance is if I were to give myself a lesson and now I actually have to act it out, you just can't be as hard on yourself for asking for help and having people help you. Uh, because, you know, I do the same thing if, if someone else were in that position. Well said, well said. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd be awesome to get you back on the podcast. This has been like super cool. I think like you have a, there's a lot of stuff in here that like, I think people will, will, will take and, and use. And obviously, like you said, injuries do happen. You can't get away from them. Like, I mean, you're a super fit dude and this happened, right? Like, it's like, we talk about, we had an episode with uh, doc Kyle about proactive recovery and, and trying to be super fit and, and work on mobility and stuff like that. So you don't get injured. Right. But like the fact that you, you are a super fit in, individuals, one of the reasons probably why you will you'll go through this faster than most people. So 
Um, I think a lot of people will relate to this podcast and get a lot out of it. So this has been awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Glad to, you know, talk about this. I usually have these conversations with myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, thank you for talking about it because I, it must not be easy. There's probably been some dark days and I imagine there'll be a few dark days in the future, but looking forward to seeing your, seeing your sort of story and see how you thank recover. You. Excited to, to see it all pan out and excited to get watch you get back on track with that 500 pound dead five minute mile and here to cheer you on every step of the way. Love it. Yeah, I'm looking forward. That's a pinnacle for me. So that's definitely uh, that, you know, not within reach right away, but I am, you know, well, I like need another crack at it too. So maybe we'll try to, we'll sync up timelines in a couple of years. I'll be. I'll be ready for it. Or at least you can just do it faster. That's what yeah. you do. You got to work out hey. of that. <laughs> it's all good as long as we're both pushing it. Awesome, Greg. Thanks very much. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, it's been awesome having Greg on the podcast, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>